Merry Christmas, everybody, and welcome to our worship service this morning, Christmas morning 2020. Well, what an extraordinary year it's been, and we come to this day, and it's just a strange day. Uh, many people are not celebrating with the usual families. Our menu may be a whole lot different. We may be in an entirely different part of the world to what we expected this Christmas. But my prayer for you is that as much as it is an odd Christmas, Christmas and an unusual Christmas, my prayer is that it would be an extraordinary Christmas in terms of your experience of the love of God in Christ Jesus as we receive again into our hearts this Christ child born in Bethlehem in the manger. So as we come to worship, let's spend a moment in prayer. Holy Father, this is a day on which we celebrate one of the most beautiful births in all of creation, the birth of Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Father, that as we come to celebrate this day, that we can call to mind those ways in which you have already blessed us. And we pray, as we do, that you would fill our hearts with gratitude, not only for all the ways in which you've seen us through the year gone by, but most of all for the Christ child, Jesus born, Son of God, Son of Mary. We pray that as we look at the text today, as we talk about what Jesus has done, what you have done through him, and what Mary and Joseph did that day so long ago, that you would soften our hearts, you would change our hearts, and you would bring us closer to what it truly means for God to become flesh. Bless us as we worship today, as we pray, as we hear your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all those things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just that they had been told. May God bless to us the reading of his word. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. So I wonder what your childhood memories are of Christmas. And I can still remember those, those great nights where it would be sweaty hot in Durban, um, 28 degrees at 11 p.m. And we kids would be chased to bed and we'd lie there unable to sleep, looking at our stockings hanging on this, the bedpost and wondering what they'll be filled with in the morning. And eventually, just out of sheer exhaustion, falling asleep, only to wake up and find the stockings stuffed full of sweets, especially those little chocolate hazelnut sweets, 
and uh, jelly tots and smarties. And along with them, I always got a Hot Wheels car. In those days, it was a matchbox car. And I remember waking up and just being so excited about playing with my little toy and uh, starting to tuck into the switch, which of course we weren't allowed any other time of the year, only on Christmas. Now, I wonder what your favorite Christmas song was. Uh, we used to sing Christmas carols. We went to church every Christmas morning. Um, but we'd also sing things like um, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way, and dashing through the snow at 28 degrees <laughs> centigrade in Durban. Um, we'd sing these songs, and they'd kind of overshadow Christmas. I know nowadays these songs start in September. Uh, you start hearing them in the malls. You start hearing um, jingle bells and um, let it snow, all sorts of other things. Uh, Boney M would come out every Christmas. And we hear them from early in the year, and these things begin to get big. They make Christmas big. The malls are full of decoration, great big trees, as I've got next to me here. There'd be lights on the trees. There'd be fixing up of the home, ready for guests. Everyone would have their bit to play. They'd have to vacuum or clean up. We'd fix furniture, just make sure everything's ready and right. And of course, mom would be out shopping for food. In our house, it was always mom. Um, Dad would be helping prepare the, the, the present list and we'd be doing lots of things. Dad would have to drag out the tree. It just became such a big thing. Perhaps the biggest thing that happened in our house around in, in the year. Um, even bigger than birthdays in our house. Now, Michael McIntyre, the English comedian, uh, he says this. The Christians love to eat to excess on their holidays. Now, other religions starve themselves on holidays. Uh, Jewish people have a holiday, they fast. The Muslims have a holiday, they fast. It's almost like Christians have had somebody look through the Bible for opportunities to eat to excess. We read about Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days. And so we decide, well, we know what we can do. We can eat pancakes beforehand. And we sort of stuff ourselves full of pancakes before Lent. We read about the cross and we think, okay, well, we'll put the image of a cross on a hot cross bun. And uh, so we eat hot cross buns until we're sick of them. And then along comes um, the Easter and we think, well, hmm, I know what we can do at Easter, at the resurrection. We can hide chocolate in the garden and then we can eat chocolate until we're sick. We, we just seem to eat at every occasion. In fact, the feast becomes the big thing. Preparing for it, eating it, then eating it again in, in uh, uh, the leftovers. The Christmas has just become huge. But what is it really all about? And uh, Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite authors, an American Christian author, he writes this, a, a young clergyman and his wife, they do all the things you do on Christmas Eve. They string the lights, they hang the ornaments, they supervise the hanging of the stockings, they tuck in the children, they lug the presents down out of hiding and pile them up under the tree. And just as they're about to fall exhausted into the bed, the husband remembers that is, he had offered to look after his neighbor's sheep. Now, the man asked him to feed them for him while he was away. And in, the pro, in, the, in the, all the press of all the other matters that night, he forgot all about them. So down the hill he goes, through the knee-deep snow, he gets to, to two bales of hay, hay out of the barn, and he takes them out to the shed. And there's a 40-watt bulb hanging by its cord from the roof, and he turns it on. And the sheep huddle in a corner, watching as he snaps the baling twine. He shakes the squares of hay apart and bego begins scattering it. Then they come bumbling in. They shove to get at it with their foolish, mild faces. And the puffs of their bre breath are showing in the air. The winter darkness is there. The glimmer of light from this tiny bulb. The smell of the hay and the sound of the animals eating. Where he is, of course, is the manger. He only just saw it. He whose business it is, above everything else, to have an eye for such things, is all but blind in that eye. He who on his best day believes that everything that is most precious anywhere comes from that manger night, easily could have gone home to bed, never knowing that he himself had just been in the manger. The world is the manger, and it is only by grace that he happens to see this other part of the miracle. Because Christmas itself is by grace. You see, the truth is, Christmas is not the tinsel, the lights, the clean houses, 
The Christmas carols or the songs we sing at Christmas time, it's not the new clothing that we get. Well, it's even worse than that. I know what Helena would say if I allowed a young couple to stay in the dirtiest, grubbiest room of the house. She'd say, you did what? But Jesus is born into the grubbiest of places. He is born into the grubbiest of places in the world. It's a backwater in Israel in, of the smallest tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. He's born into this dark, grubby place. He's born into grubby places in your life and my life. He's born into grubby places in our families, our schools, our workplaces. He's not the angry rabbi cleansing the temple, but he's born as a defenseless baby. He is dependent on a little girl and a young husband. And he comes into your world, God, born as flesh. He comes in gently. He comes easily ignored. He comes frail and yet magnificent. You see, he redeems those low spots in our lives, those grubby places. He is in them with the fullness of his creative power. Not judging, but offering hope in those spaces. You see, there is no place in your life too shameful or sorrowful for this child to be born in. There is no stable too grubby for him. And as we look into those places in our lives which resemble a dark, smelly, grubby stable, you will see this child willing to grow with you, willing to redeem those dark places and to be with you in them, to bring you out of them. Because Jesus comes to the grubbiest, the grubbiest of people by profession, the grubbiest of those by reputation, the grubbiest by brand and by clothing. He comes to the grubbiest by species, to the, the sheep and the goats and the donkeys. He comes to the animals in the stable and he comes to the shepherds sleeping rough under the stars. These were people not washed for days. And when it was cold, it was like they were camping, like when we camp, we don't want to go take our shirt off and get in the, into the cold water to wash. They keep themselves snug and warm. They, they warm themselves by sleeping among the sheep. They begin to smell like the sheep. You see, there is no one whom this king will not entertain. His mum and dad were simple folk, not kings, not emperors of royalty, not celebrities. It was far from the class which received great awards for things. And it's in this space, in these grubby spaces, that he finds you and he finds me. You see, a low sense of self-worth is the sickness of the baby boomers. And we've handed it to the generations after us. The idea that you can de define your worth because it is in the glamour, the brand, the grades, the wealth. You see, the sickness is still there. Exclusivity, acceptability. You're too short, you're too tall, too fair, too dark, too slow, too clumsy. You're unrefined or unsophisticated. But it's to these whom the angels sing. The grubby shepherds. They have no likes, they have no views, they have no reposts. They just have reliable, life-saving toughness. The angels say, do not, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. I'm telling you first, today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in rags and lying in a feeding trough. And the angelic choir appears amidst the grubby tail out in the field to people who smell like they shouldn't be in a grand hotel. And there's no Twitter, there's no Instagram picture, there's no Facebook post, there's no press or royal edict, there's no presidential TV, television appearance. The first to hear and see are the shepherds, slightly smelly, very rough, and mostly uneducated and unrefined. You see, it's to those of us who may not think of us as grand, ourselves as grand, that the angels sing. However you felt about yourself this year, if it's been a tough year for you and somehow you've been under attack, this message brings a warning and a welcome. If you feel you're acceptable, 
maybe you've not heard. There is good news of great joy. Christmas is small, but it is everything. Christmas is simple, but it is everything. We've obscured the vulnerable God-child in the grubby darkness. We've obscured him, the God who is the God of the outcast and, and the simple people. We have made it more, and yet we've robbed it of its power. We've renovated the, the stable. We've given Mary a perfect Hollywood mom makeover. And we've handed Joseph a cigar. Our perfumes have masked the sta stable smells, and the soundtrack of Oh Holy Night has drowned out the bleating and mooing and panting of the beasts in the stable. Expensive gifts honor not the Christ child in the smelly stable, as did the wise men, but our gifts reclothe the shepherds. We make them less smelly with our gifts. But we who are grubby because of life on this dusty, broken planet try our best to dress up the dirt, to make it feel better, smell better, sound better. Our tinsel obscures the Savior surrounded by the doors to our Advent chocolates below the flashing tree amidst the expensive gifts to adorn our bodies and lives. And perhaps the things are distracting us from who Jesus really is in this grubby place. Beekner writes, the word became flesh, ultimate mystery, born with a skull you could crush one-handed, incarnation. It is not tame, it is not touching, it is not beautiful, it is uninhabitable terror. It is unthinkable darkness riven with unbearable light. Agonizing laboring led to it. Vast upheavals of, in upheavals of intergalactic space and time split apart a wrenching and tearing of the very sinews of reality itself. You can only cover your eyes and shudder before it, before this. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, whom for, who is for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, came down, came down. And only then do we dare uncover our eyes and see what, he can, what we can see. It is the resurrection and the life that she holds in her arms. And it's the bitterness of death that he takes at her breast. You see, we accept a child whose life and death do not clothe us and make us smell and feel and, and seem better. They do not clothe us with haute couture or with dust us with a perfume that will make us smell better. They do not Put makeup on us to make us look better. You see, what keeps the wild hope of Christmas alive year after year, in a world which is notorious for dashing hopes, is the haunting dream that the child who was born that day may yet be born again within us. You see, he will scrub you clean from within. He will make you fully acceptable in all the right ways. The light of his cleansing will work within you and will shine through every pore and light up the grubby world around us. The streams of water will flow from your inmost being, which has been cleansed by the Christ child born that day. My invitation to you is not to look with wonder upon the manger once again, but to look at what was in the breast of that child that day his life would bring us life. His death would win us the acceptability before God, would win us perfection before God. And you're invited today to receive the Christ child through a prayer, to receive him in his birth, in his life, in his death and his resurrection, and to know what it is to be made clean. No more grubbiness for us. Cleanliness, perfection before God, so that God can begin to rebuild this world according to what Jesus called the kingdom of God. May you receive the Christ child today in all his fullness. Holy God, in a grubby place, come down for your cleansing and mine to make this world what it can be.
Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come before this manger once again to receive the Christ child, to receive his life and all he taught, his death in our place for our sin on the cross as we confess our sin and say, we are sorry, Lord, for the way in which we've made this world more grubby instead of allowing Christ through us to make it better. And we receive his resurrection so that new life can burst forth within us and we can become the people who change the world. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High, Prince of Peace, be born again into our world. Wherever there is war in the world, wherever there is pain, where there is loneliness, where there is no hope, come, you long-expected one, with healing in your wings. Holy Child, whom the shepherds and the kings and the dumb beasts adored, be born again in us. Wherever there is boredom, where there is fear of failure, there's a temptation too strong to resist. Wherever there is bitterness of heart, come, blessed one, with healing in your wings. Saviour, be born in each one of us as we raise our faces to your face, not fully knowing who we are or who you are, knowing only that your love is beyond our knowing and that no other has the power to make us whole. So come, Lord Jesus. Come to each one who longs for you, even though we've forgotten your name. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.